What is going on guys? This is Arctic Fox. Welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to delve into one of the most chilling and perplexing cases in recent history. The yogurt shop murders that happened in Austin, Texas. We're going to look at the events that led up to the crime and the investigation that followed as well as the lingering questions that remain unanswered to this day. Now Austin is a large city in central Texas, located about 80 miles northeast of San Antonio and about 200 miles south of Dallas. It has a population that currently lingers at around a million folks, but even though Austin has been a large city for a long time now, in the early 1990s, it didn't feel that way. And to many, Austin was almost like its own little bubble inside of Texas. It was a surprisingly liberal city in a traditionally conservative state, and it had a reputation for being home to the area's more progressive voices, which made sense to some. It is the state's capital, after all, but for many decades, Austin seemed to pale in comparison to the state's other large cities. For many Texans, Austin was a nice, quiet place where you could raise a family, and you wouldn't have to worry about the downsides of a large city like violent crime, which was almost in unheard of in Austin. But all this would change on the evening of December the 6th, 1991. Austin Police Sergeant John Jones Jr. signed onto duty, well aware that he was the only homicide detective on duty. And he was being filmed that night by a local CBS affiliate who was following the homicide detectives in Texas to see what it was like for police in larger cities. However, Sergeant Jones, who was a respected veteran of the police department, was fully prepared for the production crew to leave empty-handed, as was the production crew themselves. Both Sergeant Jones and the production crew were settling in for what appeared to be a quiet night when a call came in over the police radio. An Austin police department officer had called in dis dispatch that evening just before midnight, informing them that a fire appeared to be coming from a frozen yogurt shop along a sleepy street in northwestern Austin. Fire crews would arrive at the scene a short time later to extinguish the blaze, but inside would make a heinous discovery. The bodies of four teenage girls who had been shot execution style and then intentionally set on fire. The girls had been stripped down, bound, and gagged. The blaze had been started to cover up the savage crime and would leave behind a chaotic scene that ultimately raised more questions than answers. This is the story of the Austin Yogurt Shop murders. Jennifer Ann Harbison was born on the 9th of May 1974 to her parents Mike and Barbara Harbison. She would be followed just a couple of years later by a younger sister named Sarah Louise, who was born on the 28th of October, 1976. For the first few years of the girls' lives, they lived with their parents in the region of Texarkana, which is right along the Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas border, which combines elements from all three states. But when the girls were young, Jennifer was five and Sarah was just two, their mother would separate from their father and relocate to Austin, Texas. There in Austin, their mother Barbara would begin a new life for herself and eventually meet Frank Sarasi, a computer technician for Dell that everyone called Skip. The two would eventually marry, with Barbara taking on the surname Sarasi and the girls gaining a stepfather. Meanwhile, their father, Mike Harbison, would remain in New Boston, a small town in Texas near the Arkansas border, where he would live with his new wife, Debbie. Even though they lived several hours away from the girls, he would remain close with them throughout their lives. Jennifer and Sarah would grow up in their, with their mother and their stepfather in their home in the sprawling suburbs of the northern side of town. Both attended private Christian school throughout middle school in the same place they attended weekend mass. St. Louis Catholic Church, but both girls were eager to attend a public high school so they could live out the full teenage experience. Jennifer was the first to attend Lanier High School, where she would eventually serve as the president for the school's chapter of the Future Farmers of America. She also ran track and served as the student speaker of the house. Amber Sweeney, a classmate in Jennifer's government class, said that 
Jennifer was very opinionated and she wouldn't be afraid to say how she felt and she would always have several jokes. She was very humorous. Jennifer was very well liked by all of her teachers by all accounts and she interacted with all of them including her geography teacher Ed Gifford who later said that she brought joy to his classroom and she was more excited about life than any child that he had ever known. She was one of the best students that they had ever had. Jennifer was in her senior year at Lanier High School when her younger sister Sarah finally managed to join her. Sarah had graduated from St. Louis Catholic High School the prior spring on a scholarship and had carried on that momentum to Lanier High where she excelled not only as a student but as an athlete and an overachiever. Uh, she was very competitive on the school's volleyball and basketball teams and she was also on the cheerleading squad. She was on the student council. Uh, she was just very, very involved in everything, including the Future Farmers of America. And even though she was only in her freshman year of high school, she had made an immediate impact on those around her. She had established herself as assertive and enthusiastic and a vital member of the freshman class. While Sarah was just beginning her high school career, Jennifer was preparing for what lay beyond. Even though her mother wanted her to fully enjoy her teenage years, Jennifer had wanted to make some money for herself so that she could prepare for college. Her father had also recently purchased a Chevy S10 for Jennifer under the stipulation that she had to help make the payments and she had to take her sister to locations on occasion. Jennifer was more than happy to make those accommodations for her dad. And since Sarah and her got along well for teenage sisters, she had no problems hauling her sister around wherever she needed to go. And she had no issues with trying to make payments on the truck for her dad. Jennifer was working at Albertson's grocery store at first, but then she took a job at a local yogurt shop called I Can't Believe It's Yogurt at the recommendation of her friend Eliza, who told her what a great job it was. Eliza Hope Thomas was born on the 16th of May, 1974, to her parents James and Maria Thomas, and like Jennifer and Sarah, Eliza would grow up in the Austin region, and like them, she had a sister named Sonora. In 1981, when Eliza was just seven or eight years old, her parents would separate and eventually file for divorce. Her dad, James, was a social worker, and he would eventually remarry a woman named Norma Fowler, who worked as a professor at the University of Texas. The two sisters would split time between their parents, and in December of 1991, Eliza was staying with their mother, while Sonora was staying with the father, just a few blocks away from the yogurt shop that Eliza worked part-time at. Like the Harbison sisters, Eliza Thomas also attended Lanier High School. She had previously attended McCallum High School throughout her sophomore year, but transferred to Lanier because she wanted to get involved in their Future Farmers of America chapter. She loved working with and caring for animals and planned to become a veterinarian after high school. James, Eliza's father, would later say that she had always been nuts about animals and that she had kept crayfish and rats in her bedroom <laughs> which, you know, i got to give respect to the parents for allowing her to keep rats in the bedroom. That's not something that a lot of parents would do. But it showed how Eliza could care for any animal, no matter how big or small the animal was. It was Eliza's involvement in the future Farmers of America that brought her close to the oldest Harbison sister, Jennifer, who was in the same grade as Eliza, and the two became fast friends. Both would be nominated for Future Farmers of America Queen in their senior year, which became an exciting topic of conversation whenever it got brought up to either. In addition to being involved in the Future Farmers of America, Eliza was also very mechanically inclined. She excelled in the school's welding and small engine repair classes and participated in the agriculture mechanic program. She seemed to be a natural when it came to fixing up anything with parts which aided her well when she finally purchased her first car, a 1971 Volkswagen Carmen Ghia, which was bright green, that Eliza likened to her birthstone, the Emerald. 
Even though others found the car rather ugly, Eliza adored it and tried to use her mechanical skills to upgrade it whenever possible. In fact, in December of 1991, as Christmas approached, Eliza asked for little more than a plethora of car parts that she planned to replace by herself. Eliza had managed to buy the car after starting her job at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt Shop in the Hillside Center Strip Mall, which was located in the northwestern corner of Austin, Texas. She had been working there for months when she managed to convince her best friend Jennifer Harbison to apply as well. The yogurt shop was one of the few jobs that allowed teenagers to have real responsibility, and they were able to work unsupervised. Eliza had a few weekday shifts, but the two generally worked together on the weekends when they were allowed to gossip for hours, oftentimes closing the shop by themselves. Amy Lee Ayers was born on the 31st of January, 1978, to her parents Robert and Pam Ayers. She was the second child of the family, following her older brother Sean. Growing up in Texas, Amy became a huge country music fan who would later be remembered for having a crush on George Strait. She was also an animal lover who adored cats and was friendly towards all animals. She grew up on a ranch and Amy had become used to farming and had been riding horses since the age of three. Someone once asked her whether she was part cowgirl and she responded that she wasn't. Amy was all cowgirl. Amy's older brother, Sean, also was involved in the Future Farmers of America and helped get Amy involved in the group early on. Amy didn't need much encouragement. She was always wearing a cowboy hat to school and was a natural fit for the Future Farmers of America. And even though she was younger than the other girls, she became fast friends with Jennifer, Eliza, and Sarah, who were all in the same FFA chapter. Amy attended Burnett Middle School and participated in the Future Farmers of America at Lanier High School, where she was already a junior member and incoming vice president. She was planning to continue to be involved as the years went on. Though her involvement in this Future Farmers of America chapter, or through her involvement, Amy became fast friends with Sarah Harbison, whom she unfortunately didn't get to see a lot of, due to the two attending separate schools, but on the first weekend of December, the two planned on having a sleepover, which they'd get to catch up on each other's lives over the past few weeks. On the 6th of December, 1991, it was a particularly gray day, that had, and there had been a series of them. It was the second to last Friday of the school semester, and the kids throughout Austin were preparing for winter break. After leaving school that afternoon, 17-year-old Jennifer Harbison stopped by the apartment where her high school boyfriend, Sammy Buchanan, lived. Sammy had not been at school that day due to having attended a family member's funeral, and the two would hang out for a few hours at the apartment. Jennifer would return home at around 7 p.m., pick up her work clothes, and then started towards work. First, she had to pick up Sarah's best friend, Amy Ayers, and drop her off at the mall just down the road from the yogurt shop. On the weekends, the mall was usually crawling with teenage boys and girls. You have to remember, this was the mall rat generation. 15-year-old Sarah and 13-year-old Amy would end up spending the evening at North Cross Mall, which, as I said, was just down the road from the yogurt shop that Jennifer worked at, less than a mile away. At that time, the mall was one of the go-to hotspots for the area's teenagers, and it was in a very affluent corner of Austin, which was known for its movie theater and its ice rink. Both were staples of the teenage masses that would gather there on Fridays and Saturdays. This was actually the first time that either Sarah or Amy had been able to go to the mall by themselves without their older siblings or their parents, and the two were planning to have a sleepover at Sarah's house that evening, riding back with Jennifer when she got off work. That night, best friends Jennifer and Eliza, who were both 17 years old, were working the evening shift at I Can't Believe It's Yogurt. Eliza started her shift at 7 o'clock and Jennifer started at 8, and the two would be responsible for closing the store that evening. Over the next several hours, multiple customers would come and go from the yogurt shop, leaving behind scattered breadcrumbs of witnesses and sightings that police would later have to compile together. Between 8.15 and 8.30, a woman named Louisa Jones dropped by the yogurt shop picking up some frozen yogurt for her husband who had just had dental surgery. 
She would later recall seeing two teenage boys sitting in a booth near the front door who were the only two customers in the shop at the time, and they seemed to be engrossed in an item that was in the middle of the table, which seemed to be in a bag or a sack of some kind. It could have been anything, but the popular theory is that it was a sack of marbles. Both were regular-looking teenagers, and in this affluent corner of town, they appeared to be hoodlums. Jones would later describe them as having long, unkept hair and appearing to be of Hispanic origins, although she couldn't be sure of their race. All she knew is that the two teenagers gave her a sense of unease, and it would multiply in the years to come. At around 9 p.m., 17-year-old Jennifer Harbison took a short break and drove down the street, picking up her sister and her sister's friends from the North Cross Mall, which was closing. Jennifer and Amy returned to the yogurt shop with Jennifer, but would walk down a few doors to a nearby pizza shop, which was closing at 10 p.m. They bought a pizza and brought it back to the yogurt shop, where multiple witnesses would recall seeing them over the next hour or so eating pizza in the lobby and getting caught up in conversation. At around 9.30 p.m., Eliza's mother, Maria Thomas, dropped by the yogurt shop, as she and other parents regularly did during the weekend work shifts. She stayed there for a few minutes, bought some yogurt, and then left, believing that everything was fine. There were no other customers in the store at the time, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. At some point, between 9.30 and 10 o'clock, a former military policeman and owner of a security firm named Daryl Croft dropped by with a couple of acquaintances. Inside the yogurt shop, Croft noticed two separate young couples, as well as an individual young man who appeared to be alone. He described the young man as having a deep voice and a large nose and being fidgety, especially when he spoke to Croft. The young man seemed perplexed by the vehicle Croft had parked in front of the yogurt shop, which was a security cruiser. And the young man would express some weird behavior when placing his order, which was just a single can of soda, which he then took with him towards the bathroom in the back of the store, according to Croft. He never saw him leave by the time Croft left minutes later. Speaking to police at a later date, Daryl Croft would be unable to provide much more information about this young man or identify him in any kind of photo lineup, but he did claim that the young man was wearing a green jacket, which looked like something that had been picked up from a military surplus store. Between 10 and 11 multiple witnesses would come into the yogurt shop, but the final sale was registered at 1042 to a couple that had just gotten out of a movie and wanted to grab some dessert before heading home. When purchasing their yogurt, the, this couple would report seeing a couple of individuals who they believed to be men sitting at a table closest to the cash register. Both were wearing jackets or thick sweatshirts, which obscured their faces, but one appeared to be bigger or more muscular, while the other appeared to be skinnier with thin features. Unfortunately, the couple would not get a good look at the pair, but had little reason to believe they needed to. The yogurt shop was scheduled to close at 11, and by the time these two witnesses left at around 10.47, one of the teenage employees had already started to wipe down the tables and place the chairs on top. It would later be reported that the two chairs that obscured the men were sitting in close sitting that the two oh, that one of the chairs that the two men were sitting in obscured the cash register. It would only be the chairs that remained on the floor. While Jennifer and Eliza were the only employees working that evening, it's believed that Sarah and Amy, Jennifer's younger sister and her friend, were helping out so that they could leave on time. The two were going to catch a ride with Jennifer, and they likely wanted to get on with their sleepover. They were regulars at the frozen yogurt shop, and they were accustomed to helping out when they could. Witnesses did not recall seeing Sarah and Amy out in the lobby during the last half hour or so of the store's open hours. It's believed that they may have moved to the back of the store to begin cleaning up there. That was where their pizza box would later be found, indicating that they had relocated to the back of the kitchen at least for a little while. As I said before, the yogurt shop was supposed to close at 11 p.m., and as the clock continued to creep closer to midnight, the teen's parents had no reason to suspect that anything had happened to them, 
After all, the four girls were in the same Future Farmers of America chapter at the same high school and regularly stopped by the school's off-campus site to say goodnight to the animals that they had been raising. Eliza was raising a pig while the Harbison sisters were raising lambs. The teens dropped by at least twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening, and it's believed that they may have dropped by the animal pens, or at least it was believed, to care for them before heading home. Just before, when, just before midnight, Troy Gay, a young police officer with the Austin Police Department that was patrolling northwest Austin on the lookout for DWIs, happened upon the Hillside Center strip mall that I can't believe its yogurt was located in, and almost immediately, he noticed that smoke was coming from the yogurt shop itself. He would call into dispatch at 11.47 p.m. Even though it was believed that this may have been a simple kitchen fire, the call would spark an immediate response as not much else was going on in Austin that Friday evening. Fire crews would arrive at the location a short time later, with Rene Garza being one of the firefighters on duty that weekend. Garza would later testify to showing up at the scene and noticing that the lights of the yogurt shop were off with a closed sign facing outward. As he approached the front door, though, he could see the blaze burning inside, with black smoke filling the confined space of the yogurt shop and obscuring everything in the building. As Garza and his fellow firemen prepared to move in, they popped open the front door with a crowbar, gaining access to the yogurt shop. They then began battling the flames, which thankfully had been confined to a small enough location that firefighters regarded the incident as a two-alarm fire, meaning that it was moderate enough to warrant a cautious response, but wasn't intense enough to begin spiraling out of control. Within a couple of minutes, the firefighters had started to quell the fire with water from their hoses and began to gain more visibility towards the back of the store. As the flames started to dwindle, Rene Garza's partner, David DeVal, grabbed him and pointed towards an object in the back of the yogurt shop, asking, is that a foot? And that is when a horrifying discovery would be made, which would change not only the lives of everyone involved, but the city of Austin itself. Police officers at the scene made a call into authorities, eventually calling in Sergeant John Jones, who was being filmed inside his vehicle by local news networks at the time. And even though the original call came in to dispatchers that informed them that two bodies had been found, they would quickly be amended to three bodies, and then, by the time that Sergeant Jones arrived at the scene, four bodies. All had been discovered near the back door. All three of the bodies were stacked on top of one another and then set ablaze. The fourth had just been found a few feet away, separated for some unknown reason. Even though the four bodies had been burned severely to the point of being unrecognizable, it was clear that all four had been young women. Before being burned, they had been forced to undress, and then bound and gagged with their own clothing, before being shot in the head execution style. It was unknown if all had been dead at the time that they were set on fire, but that was the belief at the crime scene. Sergeant Jones, who had been the only homicide detective on duty that evening, was the first detective to arrive at the crime scene. It was now his case to handle, and ha after viewing the scene for just a moment, he stepped back outside to speak with the same camera crew that had been filming with him that evening. He would have a hard time answering any of their questions as the severity of the crime scene began to dawn on him and the rest of the first responders. The victims would be identified as four teenage girls that had been inside the yogurt shop that evening, Jennifer and Sarah Harbison, Eliza Thomas, and Amy Ayers. Police were able to identify Jennifer and Eliza through their vehicles in the yogurt shop parking lot, and then Sarah and Amy through simple process of elimination. Over the next few days, it would be reported in the press that the four victims had been teenage girls, which undoubtedly added to the terrifying nature of the crime. Everyone saw their loved ones in the victims, their daughters, their sisters, their neighbors, classmates, or even themselves. And in the years to come, many people would look back at this incident, which reporters soon began referring to as the Austin Yogurt Shop murders, as a turning point for the entire city of Austin. 
The idea that the city itself had lost its innocence that weekend remains a topic of discussion to this day. This crime was shocking to everyone in the area, but especially to the members of the Austin Police Department who had investigated similar crimes in the past, but nothing as bizarre or shocking as this. Sergeant Scott Carey of the Austin Police Department said that he had been on the force for 10 years and lived in Austin for 20, and this was the worst crime that he could ever remember. At the crime scene, it was quickly discovered that the back door of the yogurt shop had been left unlocked, and that's likely how the people responsible made their getaway since the front door had been locked and the keys were later found inside. Police would not say whether or not the cash register had been tampered with, or how, but it was later confirmed that a robbery did indeed take place. Following an audit, it would be determined that roughly $540 had been stolen from the yogurt shop, most of which came from the cash register itself. The last transaction in the register's log had come in at 11.03 p.m., three minutes after the shop was supposed to have been closed, and 13 minutes after the front doors were usually locked. This transaction was a no-sale, which indicated that the transaction had either been cancelled or the no-sale button had been pushed simply to open the register drawer. This was likely when the shop had been robbed and either been done by one of the teenage employees or the culprit themselves. A full-scale arson investigation would take place that weekend, which hoped to determine when exactly the fire had started and how. It was reported that the fire had been started in the kitchen area, which is where the girls' bodies had been found. Austin Fire Department investigator Melvin Stahl was tasked with investigating the fire and would state in his official report that the fire had been started at around 11.42 p.m., more than 40 minutes after the store was supposed to have been closed, and exactly 39 minutes after the last transaction on the cash register. This implied that the culprits had remained in the building for about an hour before starting the fire that would end up destroying or contaminating most of the crime scene. It would be reported that the fire had been burning so intensely and so hot that one of the victim's teeth had began to burn away. It was also reported that the victim's bodies had started to melt into the floor of the yogurt shop, which makes it miraculous that firefighters were able to squash it so quickly before it spread into neighboring businesses or further destroyed the crime scene. The fire had even managed to melt some of the victim's jewelry, as well as containers of cleaning supplies and paint cans in the back storage room. However, because firefighters had needed to use an excessive amount of water to kill the fire, a large amount of physical evidence had essentially been washed away from the victims and the scene itself and this would cause an untold amount of damage to the investigation, but that's something that we'll talk about later. It would be theorized that styrofoam cups full of lighter fluid had been placed on or near the bodies, which helped light the fire and increase the spread of the flames. Styrofoam itself is very flammable, and when set on fire would create an almost napalm-like substance, which would burn incredibly hot and stick to almost anything, the bodies of the four murdered teenagers in the years since the yogurt shop murders, it's been speculated that lighter fluid wasn't even necessarily used at the crime scene since the styrofoam itself, when stacked together and set on fire, would create an effect similar to lighter fluid. The, burn mar the burn marks discovered on the floor of the yogurt shop, which investigators attributed to lighter fluid, may have simply been the after effects of old styrofoam burning. In addition to lighting a fire to destroy physical evidence, police would learn that the culprits had done whatever they could to contaminate the crime scene. On the bodies of the four murdered teenagers, the responsible parties had stacked a number of paper cups and bowls from the yogurt shop, which acted as an accelerant for the flames, but in addition, police also discovered that chocolate syrup and other yogurt ingredients had been placed on or around the bodies, likely meant to mix with the blood and contaminate the crime scene. It would even be theorized that this may have been some kind of sick joke by the killers. Despite the victims being found undressed and bound in with their own clothing, it was not believed that they had been sexually assaulted, at least not in the early days of the investigation. As the autopsies were carried out by local medical examiners, the and as the autopsies took place, 
district attorneys moved quickly to seal any reports hoping to keep details from being released to the public. Despite that, though, it was theorized that more than one culprit had been involved in this crime, and evidence left behind at the crime scene indicated that there was more than one offender. Police began reaching out to people in the area that may have seen or heard something from the evening, and there were several witnesses that would later come forward. By Monday, word had spread throughout the area and Lanier High School, which was attended by three of the four victims, and the school had obviously lost its cheerful edge. Students had been excited about winter break just days prior and now had to adjust to life without three of their peers. Counselors met with the students to try to console them and help them deal with their grief. And like Lanier High School, Burnett Middle School had counselors on hand for the week after the murders in order to provide support for those who might need it. There were several vigils held for the four victims, and in the days after the murders, police had been just completely bombarded with tips from the public. This was both pertinent and non-essential information from people who believed they knew something. Of those tips, police decided to narrow in on people that had been on the yogurt shop or in the yogurt shop in the hours before the crime itself took place and began to arrange interviews with witnesses. But in the meantime, they began looking at the backstories of the four victims themselves to see if they could come up with any clues as to what may have happened. Police began to extend their search for witnesses as they began to learn more about what happened that night to the four girls. And it was revealed that their bodies were burned beyond recognition to the public. These... I mean, it was just tragic, guys. The, the, the whole town has never been the same since these murders. And there is so much to this story. You know, there's been false confessions, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. Um, but there's just so much to this that I could go on for hours. Um, but I want to get to the nuts and bolts of this, which is the false confessions. Um, just bear with me for one moment while I get to that information for you. So over the years, numerous theories have emerged regarding the identity of the perpetrators, and some believe it was a botched robbery, while others speculate about possible connections to organized crime. Um, decades have passed since the murders, and... You know, memorials have been erected. But the one thing that I do want to talk about here is that there have been people confess, and false confessions, unfortunately, have been elicited when it comes to this particular situation. Uh, you know, one of the things that I want to talk about here is the, um, the false confessions, obviously. So, let me get to the information on these false confessions here. Just bear with me for one moment. So, Robert Springsteen and Michael Scott, as well as Maurice Pierce and Forrest Welburn, were the teenagers that had been seen at the time of the crime. They had landed on the radar of Sergeant Jones early on in the investigation. Um, Maurice Pierce was arrested with a gun at the mall near the yogurt shop in the days after the crime. But then the men were questioned by Jones and his team, but they were released due to a lack of evidence. But in 1999, new investigators decided to re-question the men, and two of them, Robert Springsteen and Michael Scott, confessed to the yogurt shop murders, which implicated Pierce and Wellborn in the process. All four men were arrested, but it wasn't long before Springsteen and Scott recanted their confessions, saying they were coerced, and charges ultimately 
dropped against Pierce and Wellborn due to a lack of evidence. Springsteen and Scott were the only two to go on trial, and they were both convicted, but years later their convictions would be overturned on constitutional grounds. The Sixth Amendment gives defendants the right to confront accusers, and in Scott and Springsteen's trials, their confessions were used against one another, but they weren't allowed to question one another in court. Prosecutors intended to retry Springsteen and Scott, but before doing so, they ordered DNA tests on the vaginal swabs taken from the victims at the time of the murders. By this point, investigators had come to believe at least one of the victims had been sexually assaulted, and prosecutors wanted to take advantage of a fairly new type of DNA testing called YSTR testing. It searches for male DNA only. No one expected what it would reveal as a result of the testing. A partial male DNA profile was obtained from one of the victims, but to the surprise of the pr prosecutor's office, the DNA sample did not match any of the four men who had been arrested. Charges were dropped against Springsteen and Scott, and they were released from prison after spending 10 years behind bars. So, to this day, no one has been arrested, or, well, no one has been formally charged in the case. There's been several theories. There are other witnesses that may be the key to unlocking what happened in this case, guys. But so far, they have not been identified. They were people seen in that yogurt shop. Um, if you're from the Austin area, you have any information on this case, you can call tips in to 512-472-TIPS. But this case has been gone on for far, far too long, guys. Again, we're talking about a case that happened in 1991. It's 2024 now. So we're talking about almost, you know, 33 years since this crime took place. And these girls deserve justice. So do me a favor, guys. Give this video a like. This has been one of the deepest dives I've done on this channel. And if you want to see more deep dives like this, certainly feel free to leave your comments down below. I appreciate all of you for tuning in. Like the video. It helps the algorithm. It helps more people to hear these girls' stories. Also, share this. Share this to your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, wherever you have social media. And I do thank you so much for tuning in. Y'all be kind to one another, and I'll see you soon in the next video.